they're still playing those games. This was the chance to dominate the 70s. Touchdown, Pittsburgh! The steel curtain, personality after personality. Not guys over, that's real Pittsburgh style. Touchdown, Cowboys! Dallas was splash and dash. This is the height of what football should be. It's the teams you love, the rivals you hate, and the stories you'll never forget. Told from a different perspective, through the camera lens. Highlighting the artistry of the still photograph, FSN lets the witnesses to history tell the tales and bring the drama in focus. And he could not hang on to the ball. First of all, it's a really unfortunate play for Jackie Smith, a, a player who was all pro. It was one of the cruelest things that I've ever seen in sports. In Super Bowl 13, the Dallas Cowboys trailed the Pittsburgh Steelers 21-17 midway through the third quarter. But the Cowboys were on the march. It's third down and three, Dallas at the Pittsburgh 10. Jackie Smith gets open in the end zone and has a chance to change the game entirely. They had confused our defense. No one was guarding him. Roger, back to throw. Has a man open in the end zone. He's going to catch the pass. He's going to win the Super Bowl. Drop! Drop to the end zone. Jackie Smith all by himself. As he lost his footing and just couldn't hold on to it. As he goes down, he knows it. He knows that he has lost that opportunity. Jackie was so wide open in the end zone, it was incredible. In that photograph, every muscle is clenched. Taught. That man in that moment is so racked with pain. This was his athletic epitaph. The terrible thing to see. For an entire decade, the Dallas Cowboys and Pittsburgh Steelers rivalry defined football. The 70s was almost entirely Pittsburgh and Dallas. Dallas played in five Super Bowls. Pittsburgh won four. The rivalry. One had white uniforms, one had black uniforms. It was a meeting of the opposites, so to speak. Play hard, hit hard, and knock guys over. That's real Pittsburgh style. It fits very well with the image the town has of itself. We're the steel town up here. We're the gritty people. We're not sophisticated. We were a high-tech city and not the same type of city that Pittsburgh was. Dallas is a new city. doesn't have the tradition. They've got these fancy silver pants and star on the helmet. It could not have been more opposite. Some people made it out of class of civilizations. The Pittsburgh Steelers were one of the NFL's original teams established in 1933, but they spent decades in football purgatory. They could never muster any sort of winning season. There was a term for it, the same old Steelers, which wasn't anything complimentary. By the end of the 1960s, they hire coach Chuck Knoll, who Vince Lombardi said could be the next great coach in the NFL. The Steelers won only one game in 1969, Knoll's first as head coach. Knoll quickly decided to flip the roster. No wanted guys coming out of college that he could mold into kinds of players that he wanted. He was looking for smart players. He was looking for quality players, character and athleticism. It was a very successful formula. And then the 70s came along and the Steelers finally had a good team. The Dallas Cowboys came into existence in 1960. Their head coach was a quiet religious man, a former defensive back for the New York Giants. Tom Landry was unique in almost all aspects of his coaching demeanor. Certainly the way he dressed, Tom always wore the hat. It became his trademark. He had a very analytical mind. Tom was an engineer of sorts. In those early days, they did a lot of things that other teams didn't do, instituting the use of computers in scouting reports, and they became expert at drafting. Bob Lilly was the first player that we drafted and was just an absolutely great football player. Lilly was the leader of the Cowboys' doomsday defense, a run-stuffing unit packed with Pro Bowl players. Bob Lilly, George Andre. Mel Renfro in the secondary. Mel was probably the best athlete we ever had on our football team. Landry designed uh, 
unique system that flex defense. Basically, it was a defense designed to keep blockers off the middle linebacker and to stop the run. Despite the dominating defense, Dallas won only 18 games in its first five years. Simply, they needed an offense. In 1964, they turned the fastest man in the world, two-time Olympic sprint gold medalist Bob Hayes, into a wide receiver. Bob Hayes changed offensive football almost as much as any other player. He was the reason his own defenses were created. The 1964 draft landed Dallas the quarterback that would eventually become the face of the franchise. Heisman Trophy winner, Roger Staubach. We drafted Roger Staubach as a redshirt. He played his final year of eligibility at the Naval Academy. Staubach's post-collegiate Naval commitment delayed the start of his career until 1969. That military background served him well. He was a leader first on, first off the field. Was noted for his many, many comebacks. Brought the team from behind. The Cowboys won 10 games in 1966, 12 in 68, and 11 in 1969. They were on the cusp of greatness. First thing they had to do was clear that hurdle and it seemed to lose every year to either Green Bay or Cleveland. So getting to the Super Bowl in 1970 was a huge hurdle for them. Super Bowl V matched the Cowboys against the Baltimore Colts. Dallas played well, but lost 16-13 on a last-second field goal. I still can remember Bob Early throwing his helmet about 50 yards down the field because we'd worked hard to get there. They come back the next year, and they're so talented that they're in the Super Bowl again, and now they're taking on this Miami team led by Shula with Greasy, and the defense really bottled them up. When Staubach took over, he may not have been terribly experienced, but he was mobile, he was smart, and he certainly was tough. The 24-3 game, I'll always remember because of the fact that it finally got the monkey off our back because everybody referred to the Cowboys as the choke team. The Cowboys had reached the mountaintop. The Pittsburgh Steelers were prepared to join them. You saw both teams playing their best in those Super Bowls. They go to those two Super Bowls, and that began the juggernaut that was absolutely remarkable. While the Cowboys of the early 70s were playing in Super Bowls, the Steelers were stockpiling talent. You should be able to put that whole 1970s core of players who played on defense straight into the Hall of Fame. Elsie Greenwood, Joe Green, Ernie Fats Holmes, and Dwight White. Those four guys were the original Steel Curtain. It's called Steel Curtain because it was impenetrable. Joe Green was the first draft pick in 1969. He was such a dominating force. He set the high stance. And then a linebacker started falling in the line, Jack Hamm, Jack Lambert. Jack Lambert, the quarterback's worst nightmare. He was not going to lose. Jack Hamm played as if he had seen the game film. And then because they got to the quarterback so well, the secondary benefited. You'll never see another cornerback like Mel Blanc. So big, so fast, so physical. In addition to their dominating defense, Pittsburgh built a versatile offense, spearheaded by a pacey quarterback from Shreveport, Louisiana. Terry Bradshaw, the number one draft pick in 1970, faced a little bit of a culture shock because what's accepted in the South in terms of ways of speaking and manners, simply those sorts of things were not accepted up here. And people made fun of him, called him names. So there was that dumb tag hung on Terry. On the football field, there was no quit in him. And the other side of it was he had a gun for an arm. Pittsburgh's backfield featured running backs Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris. Franco can run over you. He can run around you. He's unbelievable. At wide receiver, the Steelers drafted two future Hall of Famers, Lynn Swan and John Stallworth. Swan redefined what a wide receiver could do. He could get up higher, he could get loose, he could catch the ball. That opens up the offense enormously. Stallworth, he is not flashy. He just manages to get open enough to hold on to the ball. 
the Steelers' progression was startling. They jumped from six wins in 1971 to 11 the next year. And in 1974, the Steelers finished 10-3-1 and, and advanced to their first Super Bowl. It was a very close game, very, very low-scoring game, very much a ground game. Pittsburgh's stingy defense allowed Minnesota only 119 yards total offense. The Steelers celebrated their first title 16 to 6. Super Bowl 9 set the tone of what the Pittsburgh Steelers were all about. The next year, the Super Bowl would launch the decade's greatest rivalry. Two powerhouses with completely different styles. Touchdown, Pittsburgh! It was pretty clear in that Super Bowl which team was the better team. The Pittsburgh Steelers entered the 1975 season looking to repeat as Super Bowl champs. The Dallas Cowboys, meanwhile, retooled their roster, updating their doomsday defense. Doomsday one, it was over, and we had Randy White and Harvey Martin and Ed Jones and what was doomsday two. Even with their new acquisition, the Cowboys were not a favorite in the 75 season. The year before, 1974, finished eight and six. There was very little to be had on the 75. It's going to be much different. To better utilize his all-pro quarterback scrambling abilities, Coach Tom Landry implemented the shotgun offense, a formation that spread receivers across the entire field. They came up with the shotgun formation. Really suited Starbucks style. Ten and four. In the playoffs, Dallas beat Minnesota and blew out Los Angeles, advancing to their third Super Bowl in six years. Dallas was a team that no one saw coming, including Dallas. They got to the Super Bowl as a complete shock to everyone. The Cowboys' opponent, the Pittsburgh Steelers. The black and gold went 12 and two and reached the Super Bowl for a second straight season. There was a sense of not only that they were the reigning champs of the NFL, but the fact that this team was for real. Super Bowl 10, the Steeler Cowboy match, was a classic game because it was two completely different styles, completely different cities. The Cowboys were the stars. They built themselves as America's team. The more Dallas said that they were America's team, the more that fired on the Steelers. The defending champs were favorites. It was a tremendously an underdog team that went to the Super Bowl and put up a terrific fight. As a matter of fact, was a hit after the end of three quarters. Dennis Dallas. A safety and two field goals gave Pittsburgh the lead. Then Lynn Swan produced the most memorable play of his Hall of Fame career. Bradshaw is deep, and they're firing downfield. Swan going after cover, and it's double caught. A sensational catch for the Steelers with Swan. I think that any sports fan who loves a particular sport or sports has certain plays that he or she carries with him or her forever. The swan catches in Super Bowl X are those kinds of plays. Bradshaw fires for the ball, and the swan going for it. Swan holds it in for a touchdown. Swan's 64-yard masterpiece gave the Steelers a 21-10 lead. Dallas quickly struck back. Look out down there. I threw a touchdown pass to Percy Howard and make it close. With 122 to play, Pittsburgh turned the ball over on down. Staubach directed the Cowboys into Steeler territory and had one final desperation throw to win the game. Staubach popping short once and throwing long for the end zone and it is intercepted. The Steelers were Super Bowl champs once again. I can't say that we completely dominated that game. That had to be tough on the Dallas Cowboys. I'd love to be playing that game over again. Unfortunately, that day, they, uh, they, they beat us. Dallas realized that they lacked a premier running back. So, in the 1977 draft, they selected Heisman Trophy winner Tony Dorsett, fresh from a national championship at Pitt. They were too one-dimensional. Well, now here came Dorsett, and he changed everything. In his rookie year, Dorsett led the Cowboys to a 12-2 record and a matchup with Denver in Super Bowl XII. When we played in the Superdome, I always remember the run 
to the left and scored the first touchdown by Dorsett. It was probably one of the great two or three yard runs you'll ever see. Dorsett ran for 66 yards and a touchdown. The Doomsday defense allowed only eight completions for 61 yards. Dallas won their second Super Bowl of the decade, 27-10. Good game for the Cowboys. They had like nine turnovers or something like that, a bunch of sacks. And it really probably wasn't as close as it seemed. The following year, Dallas finished 12-4 and four and reached the Super Bowl yet again. The Steelers, who had suffered playoff defeats the previous two seasons, also returned. Super Bowl 13 would be a rematch of Super Bowl 10 and a battle to determine the team of the decade. Dallas Cowboys standpoint, they were still a little raw from losing the earlier championship game. So now they're the defending champions coming back against the Steelers. Now they had a few more weapons. They didn't have Dorsett in that game. This time the teams appeared evenly matched, but the Cowboys Hollywood Henderson may have provided Pittsburgh with the edge when he mocked Terry Bradshaw's rural upbringing. Everybody remembers his famous remark about Terry Bradshaw, you know, he couldn't spell cat if he gave him a C in the A. Everybody had bulletin board material, and Henderson's bulletin board material appeared on the front of Newsweek. Bradshaw proved he could spell one thing, MVP. Bradshaw throws deep for Stallworth to the end zone, touchdown! By halftime, he had already destroyed the Super Bowl passing record. Pittsburgh led 21-14. It was a wide open game. It went back and forth, and there was a lot of turnovers. On defense, they had some things that we didn't know how to stop or couldn't stop. Dallas had first-half success with the running of Dorsett, but in the second half, they relied primarily on Staubach and the passing game. I never understood that game on why they stopped running me in that game, but I'll never forget a lot of the Steelers saying, you're the highest paid decoy we ever see. Pittsburgh led 21-17 midway through the third, and Dallas was driving. It's third down to three, Dallas at the Pittsburgh 10. Jackie Smith gets open in the end zone. Has a chance to change the game entirely. Roger, back to throw, has a man open in the end zone. Cut, touchdown, drop! Dropped in the end zone! Jackie Smith didn't drop five balls in a Hall of Fame career. If you threw him that pass again a hundred more times, he'd catch it 99 times. Oh, bless his heart, he's got to be the sickest man in America. Though Dallas had other chances to take the lead, they could never recover from the drop pass. Pittsburgh would win 35-31. It's all over. Could have gone either way. We were able to come out on top. I think that the Cowboys, that was probably one of their toughest losses. I think that was probably the most disappointing loss I've ever had. It would have been the first team to win three Super Bowls when we played Pittsburgh, and this was the chance to, to dominate the 70s. The following year, Pittsburgh cemented its legacy with a 31-19 victory over Los Angeles in Super Bowl XIV. It was the Steelers' fourth title of the decade. The fourth Super Bowl was more than icing on the cake. The fourth Super Bowl was Olympus. It was Valhalla. No one had won three, and here comes number four. The Cowboys' record in the 70s was better as far as one loss, but the Steelers beat the Cowboys twice, and consequently, they're the team of the decade. Coming up, the rematch, 16 years later. People were excited in Pittsburgh to win another Super Bowl, and the fact that it was Dallas just added to it. After their victory in Super Bowl XIV, the Pittsburgh Steelers fell to earth, failing to reach the Super Bowl throughout the 80s and the first half of the 90s. The Cowboys rebuilt in the late 80s and won back-to-back -back titles in 92 and 93. Dallas had been in a position in the 90s where they were a, a pretty dominant football team. Dallas reached the title game again in 1995. Their opponent, familiar, the Pittsburgh Steelers. That was a really good Steelers team that played in the Super Bowl 30. They had a good balance of run, pass with Neil O'Donnell, and a good defense. But the Steelers were overmatched. There was a little bit of David and Goliath to this, that the Steelers were really the Davids. They were the little guys. Pittsburgh put a scare into them late into the game, and the game really turned for good 
on an interception. Larry Brown's second interception sealed a 27-17 Dallas victory, but the game bore little connection to the hallowed rivalry two decades earlier. The Cowboys did get to beat their old nemesis, but the truth of the matter is, Aikman and Smith and Irvin and those guys, they really weren't terribly invested in that rivalry. The final tally, Pittsburgh 2, Dallas 1. And a lot of the Cowboys, personally, are still upset about it. We see some of the players, and they're still alleging. They're just sitting there going, we should have won. If you get those guys who played 30 years ago, get them in a room together now, get a couple of cold ones going, it's pretty funny. They're still playing those games. They had some great battles. And you saw both teams playing their best in those Super Bowls. People look back on that era so fondly because these were great teams. This is the height of what football should be.